Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. You are greatly appreciated. This week we are discussing the unsolved case of the Short family and the details surrounding it. As always, I invite you to join me as we remember the Short family. The patriarch Michael Wayne Short was born on February 18, 1952 to parents Billy and Annie Arrington Short. He was one of four children, having one brother and two sisters. Shortly after entering adulthood, Michael married his first wife, who he had three sons with. Sadly, this union would end and Michael would go on to marry his second wife, Mary. Mary Frances Hall was born on April 20, 1966 to parents Margaret Hall and George Hall. Mary came from a large family being just one of seven children and was not married prior to Michael. After his divorce, Michael and Mary met and became romantically involved. After a courting period, the two became Mr. and Mrs. Short and had one child together. On July 12, 1993, Jennifer Renee Short was born. The Shorts lived together in Oak Level, Virginia, in a brick ranch-style home, located off of U.S. Route 220, a busy highway in the area. Oak Level is a small community with a population under 1,300 residents and is located outside of Bassett, Virginia. The Shorts were described by neighbors as quiet, they mostly kept to themselves but were friendly nonetheless. When they had the choice, they'd rather spend the whole day outdoors together. The Shorts were very close with each other, with no real issues amongst the family. This even extended to Michael's three older sons, who did not live with them. Jennifer attended Fixboro Elementary, where teachers stated she was a good student and just the sweetest girl. She didn't do anything without permission. Overall, the Shorts didn't seem to bother anyone or anything. Michael and Mary worked for Michael's company, MS Mobile Home Movers. Allegedly, at the time of their death, business was not well. In fact, it was getting so bad, the Shorts decided to put their home up for sale because of their financial situation. They planned to move into their own mobile home until things took a positive turn. Michael apparently considered moving out of state to South Carolina as a new start for his family, feeling leaving Virginia might be the best option. But neither of these plans came to fruition. On August 14, 2002, Michael and one of his employees, Chris Thompson, spent the evening working on a truck in Michael's garage. Meanwhile, Mary picked up a late dinner for the family at a nearby fast food restaurant around 11 p.m. Chris Thompson stayed at the short home for several hours before returning to the motel down the road that he was currently living at. Then, presumably sometime after midnight, the short family turned in for the evening. What happened after 12 a.m. remains a mystery to this day. The following morning, August 15, 2002, Chris Thompson returned to the short home around 9 a.m. He and Michael made prior plans to drive to Christiansburg, where Michael needed to pick up a truck for his business. Upon his arrival, he noticed the garage door was open. This wasn't in an uncommon practice since Michael had a couch and a TV in the garage. Chris knew Michael often fell asleep in the garage and wasn't shocked to see him still on the couch. He approached Michael to shake him awake, but then he noticed Michael had what appeared to be a gunshot wound to his forehead. Without a second thought, Chris called the Henry County Sheriff's Office and authorities arrived shortly after. After the discovery of Michael, investigators ventured further into the home hoping to find survivors rather than more victims. The hope was short-lived, and the couple's bedroom was the body of Mary Short. Mary was on their bed and also suffered a gunshot wound to her head. When nine-year-old Jennifer's room was approached, they noticed her bed slightly moved and sheets pulled back, but Jennifer was nowhere to be found. 22 caliber casings were found next to both Michael and Mary's bodies. DNA was found inside of the home, but investigators did not disclose additional information regarding it. Beyond the 22 casings, additional evidence recovered from the home included a 12-gauge Winchester shotgun, one box of shells, a 22 caliber rifle, partial box of 22 ammo, a business checkbook, computer disk, and a briefcase with undisclosed documents inside. 
also found was a latent impression of a message written on a window in the garage, which read, I'm glad to see. However, it's unclear if this was related to the crime. On the counter, they found $600 in cash, ruling out robbery as a possible motive. The phone lines to the home were found to be cut, indicating premeditation. The house showed no signs of a struggle, which led investigators to believe Mary and Michael were murdered in their sleep. No evidence found in the home led investigators to believe that Jennifer was harmed, but forcibly removed from the house. Investigators reached out to family members, asking if anyone knew where Jennifer was, but this turned up no results. The search was widened beyond the family's home to the outlying wooded areas with hopes that Jennifer made it out of the house. But after hours of searching, the worst became reality. Jennifer was missing. An Amber Alert was issued and was pushed beyond the state of the crime scene, since hours had passed before the bodies were even discovered. The Amber Alert brought tips from states away, but they turned out to be dead ends, bringing them no closer to finding Jennifer. Her picture was featured on local and regional broadcasts, with larger networks picking the story up early on. Days passed with search crews composed of family and volunteers combing acres around the Shorts' home. The Sheriff's Department brought in canines who did pick up Jennifer's scent, but only in areas she was known to frequent. Helicopters were also brought in for aerial views, but again nothing was found and weather conditions made it even harder. Chris Thompson, who discovered the bodies, fully cooperated with the investigation. When asked about the Short family, he stated all members were alive and well when he left the night of the murders. In fact, Jennifer was already in bed. He was questioned extensively and eventually cleared as a suspect. There were reports of a vehicle from neighbors leaving the Short home not long before the bodies were discovered, prior to 9 a.m. Some reports stated seeing a red van, while others described it as just dark colored. All of the statements pertaining to this were vague and not a strong lead in the case. Beyond Chris, they had no additional suspects. Investigators grasped for answers. They pulled records from the open houses held at the property, hoping to find something, but it's unknown if this generated additional leads. On August 23, 2002, the funeral for Michael and Mary Short were held. Unknown to the attendees, investigators filmed the service in order to catch suspicious behavior, but no one acted out of the ordinary. With no suspect, motive was difficult to establish. At first, Michael and Mary were the focus of the investigation. They believed due to his failing business and sudden interest in a move, Michael may have made some enemies along the way but none of this could be proven. An incident from over a decade ago was uncovered involving Mary and a previous job. Allegedly, while working at Pluma Inc. plant as a seamstress, a man looking for Mary was asked on multiple occasions to leave the property. No records were found to indicate Mary filed a restraining or protective order of any kind against this man. In fact, when he was removed from the premises, she asked them not to contact the police. No one at her job knew the man, and additionally, it's undetermined if this incident was at all related to their deaths. On September 4th, 2002, just mere weeks after being buried, Michael was exhumed for further testing, according to authorities. Allegedly, this was done to retrieve hair samples that were not taken during his original autopsy, something many were confused about. Law enforcement was not open with the public about why they did this which fueled rumors that Michael was being tested to confirm his paternity to Jennifer. Even though the department was strange about discussing the paternity angle, they did later state Michael was her father. Without a strong case against Michael or Mary, investigators believe Jennifer was more than likely the target, since she was taken rather than murdered. The community worked to keep the Shorts case in the public eye and begged for Jennifer's safe return. They continued to post her photos on every corner and keep her name in the nightly news. But the search received unfortunate news in September of 2002. In Stoneville, North Carolina, 30 miles from the short home, Eddie Albert found his two dogs on a private property playing with what he thought was an old wig, so he threw it in the trash. Two days later, the dogs were found playing with what appeared to be a turtle shell. But when Albert picked it up, he realized it was a human skull and called the police. 
For weeks, police searched the property where bone fragments and teeth were found under a nearby bridge on September 25, 2002. This evidence was sent away to the Virginia Division of Forensic Science Lab located in Roanoke, Virginia. On October 4, 2002, the remains were positively identified as Jennifer Shorts. It was confirmed that Jennifer's cause of death was due to a gunshot wound to the head by the same caliber weapon as her parents. One positive that came from the search was the discovery of a potential suspect. Located one mile from the remains was a mobile home belonging to 66-year-old Garrison Bauman. Police hoped to question Bauman about anything he may have seen, but Bauman was nowhere to be found. Days after the discovery of the remains, police received a call from Bauman's previous landlord, Gary Lemons, who claimed he had information pertaining to the investigation. He claimed two days before the murders of the Short family, Bauman told him that he paid a man in Virginia to move his mobile home, and if he didn't move it or return his money, he would have to kill him. The landlord claimed he also saw Bauman putting a false floor in his van and drilling holes in the side of a compartment. On August 15th, the day of the murders, he also approached his landlord with a pistol. The next day, August 16th, Bauman was gone and his mobile home had been moved. It turned out Bauman left for Canada. John Beasley, a friend of Bauman, allowed him to leave his mobile home on his property for the time being. Through the landlord, police were able to enter Bauman's rental property, which was located in Mayaden, where they recovered numerous items, including a map, which was marked in red with the location of the short home. Despite the way things started to look, Beasley claimed everything was a coincidence, such as Bauman's trip to Canada. Beasley stated Bauman planned to move and Canada was high on his list and this trip was planned well in advance. He had no criminal past other than a few DUI charges. On October 15th, authorities traveled to Yellowknife Northwest Territories, Canada, to find Bauman, who was considered a material witness at the time. However, Bauman was already being detained by Canadian authorities on an immigration violation. On October 22, 2002, Bauman returned to the United States after being deported from Canada. Upon his arrival, Bauman was held in custody while a material witness warrant was served against him. On October 30, 2002, Bauman appeared in court in Roanoke where the warrant was dropped in exchange for his testimony on what he knew about the case. He testified before a grand jury on November 12, 2002, where no indictment followed. Bauman was never charged with anything regarding the Short family, and continued to deny having any involvement until his death in December of 2014. In 2007, investigators officially cleared Bauman as a suspect in the case. In relation to the Short case, only three people have been indicted on charges related. In May 2005, Timothy Sampson, Jerry Mills, and Tony Epperson were charged with providing false information to investigators about what they claimed to have seen on the night of the murders. Sampson and Mills claimed that night they were in Bassett, Virginia, where they were scoping for a possible target to rob, when they saw a man who resembled Abraham Lincoln leaving the home with a lifeless girl in a nightgown. Allegedly, the men also threatened people investigating the case wanting to collect reward money by linking Bauman as the perpetrator in the case. However, the entire story they provided was a lie, and it led investigators on a false chase with Bauman being the focus of the investigation. Tony Epperson also lied to investigators and was similarly involved with the false claims against Bauman. All three were charged with conspiracy, perjury, and providing false information, and were sentenced for several months in prison. 2006 also brought indictments against several members of the Henry County Sheriff's Office for corruption, leading many to believe the Shorts case may have been a victim of mishandling. Officials from local and federal authorities were brought in after this to take an active role in the Short investigation, with a task force also being created. The task force consisted of members from the FBI, Virginia State Police, County Sheriff's Department, and ATF. They met regularly to work their case following leads on several persons of interest. On March 18, 2009, the FBI released several sketches to the public of their potential suspect, 
who was seen by several witnesses near the home at the time of the murders. After the discovery of Jennifer's remains, the bridge she was found under was renamed in her memory. The former neighbors of the Shorts continue to bring awareness about the family. Bike rides are organized with all the money raised being donated to the Short Scholarship at Bassett High School. By December of 2002, the family home was auctioned off, but sat vacant for more than 16 years. Then, in a strange turn of events, a suspicious fire broke out in February of 2019, where the home burned completely to the ground. The cause of the fire is still unknown to this day. Over two decades later, the Shorts case remains open and active, with the investigators still working all tips and leads. Currently, an $80,000 reward is being offered for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible. If you or anyone you know has any information regarding the murders of Mary, Michael, and Jennifer Short, you are asked to contact the Henry County Sheriff's Office or Crime Stoppers. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. The contact information for those organizations trying to close the short case will be listed in the details of this video if needed. These unsolved cases can be very frustrating, especially with the passing of time, so hopefully by continuing to keep them relevant and in the public eye, the remaining members of the Short family can finally get some kind of justice. As always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them in the comments below and we can chat about this case. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. I appreciate this community so much, and I realize I wouldn't be here without all of you, so thank you again. I hope everyone has an awesome week ahead of them. You've already made mine. But for now, I will see you in the next one. Be safe out there. Bye, friends.